Um, so, my name is Roger Williams. Uh, I have a company called Roger Williams Media. It's a marketing company here in town. And one of the things that I do for my clients is I do video blogs. Because um, the reason that I got into doing that is because it's really hard to get people to write. Um, and, you know, a lot of my clients are busy people and so they're running around. And I found the easiest thing to do is put them in front of a camera for a couple of minutes and just get them to talk about their business. And so, um, I, you know, I, I don't want to claim to be an expert in this. Um, I, I get paid, I make a living doing it, so maybe there's some things I can pass along that could be helpful. And I've tried a lot of different things, so maybe you can learn from my mistakes. Um, the, the, the topic of this speech is how to make your video blog stand out. And, uh, you know, I think, and, and also I'm going to ramble a little bit. I didn't really prepare any slides. Uh, so please interrupt if you have any questions or anything like that, or you have better suggestions or, you know, different ways of doing things. Please don't feel afraid to interrupt me and tell me to shut up for a second. But, um, so I'll do a couple of minutes of just kind of talking about how I kind of figured things out. And then, you know, I want to have as much interaction as possible. So, um, you know, when I first got into doing video, my first client that I worked with doing video blogging on, um, you know, uh, he, he had um, a lot of experience going on in television. And I saw that when I was first approaching him, I was going to do some like SEO work and, you know, boring marketing stuff. And, uh, and I saw, you know, he had all this TV interviews and I was like, why don't we do video, video blogging? And he, and he was like, of course, loved it because he loved seeing himself on, on um, video. But the other reason that I think video blogging is a really good method of conveying stuff is that the online video is taking off. Um, there's a really good website that I recommend uh, if you, if you want to get into this, doing this stuff. It's realseo.com, R-E-E-L-S-E-O.com. Invaluable resource. They post so much content and information solely focused on online video. And I found them early on, and, and they had a bunch of, of good suggestions. But uh, you know, the interesting th stuff is the research about online video content. So millennials, especially, are getting all of their influence off of online video now. And television advertising is dead to anybody who's under 30 years of age. Um, so you know, anybody who's got their marketing plan kind of on television advertising, I immediately am funneling them into online video. Um, Do you know what the demographics are for 40 and 60? So it's it's growing faster. Um, the the faster end, it's funny. The fastest growing market is 60 and over for mm -hmm. for social media and online video and all this stuff because it's the only way they can communicate with their grandchildren mm -hmm. is through social media. And then once they're communicating on Facebook with their grandchildren, they're getting all these videos. Um, but the other thing that was very interesting uh, about some research that recently came out was the most popular types of videos. So number one, the most popular type of video, no surprise, is, is comedy videos. People go onto YouTube or Funny or Die or whatever and they want to watch some, some funny videos. Uh, but what was really interesting to me was the second most popular type of video being watched is educational slash DIY videos. And I know this from personal experience. I go on YouTube all the time and I watch screencasts or, you know, like I just got a GoPro camera and I found a bunch of guys who, who just make these tips and tricks videos about GoPro cameras. And, I, and I've watched probably close to like 80 of them in the last week. Um, so, you know, the time, the time is ripe to start doing video blogging for because the audience is there. YouTube is the second most popular website on the internet after Google, and Google shows YouTube video results in their organic results. So, um, you know, from a, from a marketing and SEO perspective, uh, putting everything onto YouTube is just a no-brainer. And then from a business perspective, it's a no-brainer because the most expensive bandwidth is video bandwidth, and YouTube is totally free. So you've saved a huge expense right there. Um, so how do you get your video blog to stand out? You know, how do you, how do you make it better? Um, and this is something that I'm constantly 
learning more of and trying new things on. So anything I put out here, trust me, it's just what I've currently found to be kind of the best practice. Um, so starting from the very beginning, before you even set up your or purchase a camera, lighting, and microphones, uh, it's really figuring out what you're going to do videos about. And you know that goes back into blogging in general. Um, but you, you, know, you need to have like an overarching theme that your show is going to be on. So, you know, so why are you doing this? If it's a personal blog, you know, are you going to do like a food blog or a lifestyle blog? Um, you know, what's the overall theme? If it's a business blog, it's a little bit easier to define. Uh, but you know, now it's, okay, what are you specifically going to talk about? And for business, I recommend starting with your FAQs. You know, you can, you can uh, shortcut a lot of sales and support issues by just doing a two to three minute video of the most frequently asked question that you get. And the good news is, is that you're, you're getting, one way that I always pitch it is imagine recording your best salesperson having their best day ever, and that's what your customers always see. So, you know, that's what you should be, that's what you should be aiming to do, and if you need to shoot the video a couple of times or revise it in a few months, so be it. Um, but you can really, you know, you can, you can shortcut the sales process so once people finally contact you, they know who you are, they know what you're talking about. Uh, and then from support issues, you know, you, you're just, that's a whole bunch of time that you're not having to spend either on the phone or face to face fixing something. You can either explain it or do a screencast. And, you know, this is all really good information to give people. So, you know, making sure that you spend at least a little bit of time, you know, an, a, a rough outline of what you want to talk about is more than enough. If you want to go in and write scripts, you know, good for you. I don't do that. Um, you know, I just keep it as quick and easy as possible. And then I just do multiple takes until I get it right. Um, so, you know, the big, you know, getting into equipment and all this stuff, I mean, you can go on for days and days, um, and you can spend a little bit of money, or you can spend a lot of money, and it depends on, you know, if, you, if you're going for a business focus or a personal focus uh, for your blog. Um, when it comes to cameras, if you have a smartphone, if you have an iPhone or one of the newer Android phones, the camera on that is really more than good enough for the video quality you're going to get. First of all, it's you're putting this onto the internet, so 1080p is not even something you need to worry about because most people's screens aren't even 1080p. Most laptops are less than 1080 um, pixels. So don't worry too, you know, don't get too caught up in the camera stuff. I use a, a Canon 60D, which is a DSLR, about $1,000. It's a little on the pricier side, but you know, I'm charging clients for this, so. I can justify that expense. You don't have to go all the way to that. It's a lot more complex. There's a lot more stuff you have to learn about. Um, so with the camera, you know, start simple. Where you want to spend money and time is figuring out lighting and sound. Um, you know, you can have one of the best looking videos in the world. Like light and light, I think sound is really the most important one because you can have the best looking video in the world, but if I can't hear it, I'm not going to watch it. Um, so, when it comes to sound, there's, there's a couple of different options, and I just recommend doing an external microphone of some sort, something that's separate from your camera. Even if you get a DSLR, the microphones are terrible on those. Um, so, you've got a couple of different options. There's a lot of people that just use their iPhone, they have, or they have a second iPhone, and they just get it closer. Uh, a cool thing that I just learned about that I'm going to start trying for some jobs where I don't necessarily have one on my wireless lapel mics is the headset that comes with your iPhone has got a little microphone on it. You can run that up the inside of your shirt and tape it on the inside of your shirt, and the sound that it's going to record off of that is, is it's more than enough, and the quality is, is more than good enough. Um, so, you know, really look at that. You don't have to go crazy with microphones. I mean, you can do the iPhone option there. Um, there's some Seinhauser USB mics that I use for my podcasting that are like 30 bucks. They have USB and an XLR cable on them, um, and I, you can get them off of Amazon, 32 bucks. Um, uh, and if it's a USB mic, you can just plug that into your laptop and record straight into your laptop while you're shooting the video over here. You're adding a little bit of complexity because now you've got a separate video from audio file and you have to match those up, but it's really not that difficult. I, so I use uh, Final Cut Pro 10. Um, but you can use iMovie 
Uh, and on a PC, I don't know what you use, but there's probably something. Yeah, I think uh, actually Sony has one. So with, with iMovie and Final Cut Pro 10, Matching up the audio is pretty easy. You know, some people say that you have, they have you do like a clap at the beginning and that gets a nice high peak on your audio file and you can match those up. Um, so what's happening is whatever camera you're using is, is recording audio, but then you have an external source that's also recording the audio. And that way, you know, the camera's back here, but you want to have another microphone that's close to the person so it sounds good. And then in your editing program, you just drag and drop your video file in, and then you drag and drop the audio file in, and you can just eyeball it, okay? And then what you do is you just you play the video and you watch, and if the lips and the sound match up, you're fine. But one thing that I have found um, is that sometimes there's a slight discrepancy, so make sure you watch the beginning of the video, and then skip all the way to the end and watch it, and make sure that it still looks good. And if not, you might need to nudge the, the audio file just left or right a little bit. Um, you don't have to get as complex as that if you want to just record everything off of the same camera and microphone. You can do that as well. Uh, and that'll, that'll simplify your process there, but you might have to spend some more money in getting a uh, whole microphone set up and all that. Um, I'm rambling a lot, so if anybody's got any questions. Yeah, uh, the background, like, uh, I do a lot in the kitchen, Yeah. so I have, I do it on the phone, yeah. and you can hear, but it's so, it's empty, like, right, because everything's quiet, Yeah. and I tried to overlay this whole music thing, and all of that, and that was hard, and I started jacking it up, so, uh, sure. what, what, what do we do for that open, hollow sound? Yeah, so that, it, it, it um, dealing with the room's uh, audio ambiance is one of the most, that's one of the more challenging things. Um, when you start getting into the professional level of all this stuff, if you've ever been onto a sound stage, it's amazing. You're like, I have no idea. You know, you watch videos or infomercials that people have made, and you're like, okay, that looks you know nice enough. But then if you actually go to a sound stage where they're shooting this stuff, I mean, it's it's so much work is going on. And, and like at my studio at home, I've got so much lighting and all this stuff set up. And, when the clients first come over, they're a little overwhelmed. I'm like, well, that's just kind of how it goes. For doing a practical shot like that in a kitchen, first of all, you've probably got windows in there. And so those are horrible audio reflectors. I mean, those are what, those are what it's gonna cost. If they're out of the shot uh, and you've got drapes or something, you can, you can pull the drapes and that will help with the audio reflection. The problem is you're losing light now. Yes. So you either need to bring in additional lighting um, or you need to try out, try getting the, like with the iPhone with the lapel mic or something. If you can get, the closer you can get the mic to the person, the less you're going to need to mess around with audio enhancement in your editing. Okay. Um, I still do some audio enhancement in, in post. Uh, Final Cut Pro 10 has got really good tools for that. Don't know how good iMovies are. I use Final Cut now. Okay. It's so much faster. Yes. You know, um, there's a lot of other features to it that I don't necessarily use, but it's like when you're rendering stuff, it's just, you know, it's so much faster. Um, but yeah, audio, it's tricky. You've got to experiment around a lot of it. Um, the, so my, uh, what I use is this Zoom H4n. It's about a 200 to $300 audio recorder. It's really, really good. It's professional level stuff. Um, but and it's got stereo microphones built into it, so I just put that on a tripod right in front of the person, but it's just out of the frame, mm -hmm. and so that can work. Um, but once again, it's getting it as close as possible. If, you know, the next level up from that is getting a boom mic that hangs over the person. And, you know, you go onto Amazon, you can go onto B and H Photo and spend just a few hundred dollars. It's just a question of how crazy you want to get with this stuff. You can really get out of control quickly. Um, but yeah, getting that, getting that mic closer. Is the Final Cut Pro, is that for Windows too? No, nah, that's, that's, that's actually software made by Apple. So the only thing they've ever done that's on Windows is iTunes as well. And it's considered one of the best programs on Windows. Um, as far as microphones, because I'm kind of researching microphones right now, have you, um, debating, you know, 
you can go real high end on the microphones that attach to cameras. What's your experience, even a high end one that attached to cameras versus, would you still want to get a microphone really close to them? What camera? It's a DSLR. Okay, so the inherent problem with DSLRs is the hardware that they're using, the microphone preamps in the camera are just terrible. They're, well, they're, it's, it was an afterthought. So uh, Canon like completely stumbled into becoming a video company with their DSLRs. So the 5D Mark II came out like five years ago, and they added high def video to it. Just so, hey, when photojournalists are out there, they can shoot some extra video. Right. And then all the film guys and a couple people in Hollywood, uh, one good guy to follow is Philip Bloom. He's out of the UK. He worked for the BBC as a cameraman for a couple of decades, and then now he's a freelance videographer. And he was one of the first guys to really start blogging about using the 5D Mark II as a serious camera. Um, and so he's always got good stuff. He's got lots of good guest posts and technique. But you know, one of the things that he pointed out is it's just the hardware they've got on those are just not good. There's, so you've got a couple of options. One is you can buy a device. Basically, it's a microphone preamp that uh, they've, they've built a tripod um, Threads into it, so you can actually oh, attach okay. the camera onto it and run the audio in. And, and out yeah, of it. and you can plug them all together. And the nice thing then is that then you've got just one file. But you've got your video file and the sound is. You're really still running it straight into the camera. And, and yeah, and everything's right. getting recorded there. Um, so that's, that's my question: Is can you get good enough, you know, audio directly onto the same file on the camera? Is there an easy? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean. Easy? At the end of the day, if you want the best quality, so you know, there's there's what there's the triangle of engineering or something. There's best quality is getting right, shipped right. quick, and there's you can have two, or two or three. If you want the best quality, what Hollywood and all the top people in the industry do is they're they're they've got their video stuff going on over here, and the audio stuff's being handled separately by somebody. Um, and in that way, that person's just watching the audio levels the whole time. They're getting the boom mic as close as possible. So if you're really going towards quality, that's where you want to end up at. Um, Rode uh, makes some of the best boom mics. I have their one that attaches to the iPhone. Yeah. It's pretty cool, yeah. yeah. I actually like your idea of setting it up, because that was one thing I struggled with. I've tried like the boom mic setup, but having it kind of, you know, getting it close enough, I was actually playing with it last night, the input levels, but getting it close enough and out of frame to still get the audio you want. Yeah, yeah. So. You know, it, it's something that you, you, you've got to always keep your eye on it, too. I mean, every time you bring somebody in, everybody's volume level is different. So you have to make sure you're adjusting the levels. Uh, you want to get them as high as, usually you're shooting for like 6 to 12 dBs for voice, okay. is kind of what I've read a little bit. Um, I still end up in post a lot of time jacking the volume of the voice up just a little bit. Um, so yeah, endless, endless stuff to play Do you um, so you film in a studio and you have to do this against a black screen? Or um, do you have scenes that you set up for? <laughs> I don't. Uh, I So I've had a couple of different types of setups. Um, the first client I started working with, we were just in one of his conference rooms. He had some art and all this stuff. And so it, it was kind of neat. Um, some people felt distracted by it. Then he moved into a high rise downtown. And so we actually, you know, he was like, oh, I wanted to shoot out the windows. And oh, okay. Overlooking, yeah, overlooking Phoenix, and I, and it's like, well, the problem is, is that if you set the exposure for inside, it's just all white, right? So we had to get plexiglass fitted for the windows. Like, it was pretty cool. Like, we, we definitely figured some neat stuff out. Uh, but now I just do it all in front of a white screen. So I went on to Amazon. I spent eighty-seven dollars and got the full frame, you know, two tripods with the top bar, um, and that came with a black. Uh, a green and a white screen, and two fluorescent lights. Uh, For eighty-seven dollars. It was like eighty-seven or something, you know. Um, so yeah, Amazon. There's a ton of good stuff on Amazon, and, and you know, it's that's I would definitely. So getting into talking about lighting and backdrops, I would absolutely recommend doing something like that. I like to do it all on a white backdrop. Just it lightens things up a little bit. Because I'm trying um, black and it just uh, it's. I have I've filmed about five of them and it, it, I'm just I'm not able to get it looking how I want it with a black backdrop. So um, uh, I'll tell you how I 
guys set it up and maybe you know you're doing something a little differently so you want the person to be probably at least five to six feet away from the backdrop okay. whether it's white or black um, and that way you're not worried about their casting a shadow onto it if it's a black backdrop you don't need to have extra light you don't need to have lights going on in the backdrop right right uh, but you need to make sure you have lights going on to the person so getting into talking about lighting your primary subject uh, the general rule of thumb is you want to do at least a two-point light source. So both at about 45 degrees angles off of the camera. And then that way, and you want to have a, a, a primary light source, and then this one's a little bit dimmer or secondary. Uh, but they can be the same exact light, and you don't need to stress about it. Um, if you want to get fancy, you do a three-point light source. So you either have it directly above or off to the side. And then what that does is it, it, it kind of highlights the hair a little bit and just kind of brings out a little bit more definition, makes them stand out a little bit more. Is that as necessary on a white background? Um, it, it, the three-point lighting system is considered like the end-all be-all. Right. I don't use that. I just use a two-point because it's, it's a, it's a, I've converted a, a bedroom in our house into my office, which has become my studio. So uh, I'm a little cramped on space, but... I think with the two-point light source, you're fine. As far as specific lights go, um, just go to Home Depot. They've got those $15 shop lights that have a, they're, it's a clamp, yeah. and then it's just an aluminum bowl, and you put a fluorescent light in there. Go start with those. And then what you want to do is either go to the photography store. There's uh, Photo Finish is on 7th Street. That's where I end up going, but Tempe's got one. Um, or you can go online and you get, uh, it's photographic paper, filter paper, it's just white filter paper, and uh, 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 laundry pin those in front of the light, and then that like softens the light and makes it just look a ton better. Uh, start with that, uh, and that way, you know, it's plenty of light it generates, um, and you're keeping your budget super low. So, and then you just need some tripods to put those on. And once again, you can go on Amazon and get some lighting tripods for like 10 or 20 bucks. I mean, they're, they don't need to be super heavy duty because all they're doing is holding up the lights, right? Um, so, I mean, that's how I do, like, it's a black background. That's how I kind of do that. And, and that works perfectly. Um, so, you know, maybe try that out. You know, it's, it's, you know, you want to have a dedicated space for this stuff because that way you can just leave everything set up uh, is really the most important thing. Like, Because now I, I just tell my clients to come on over for, I need them to come over for an hour. We'll crank out five or 10 two minute videos for the month and then they go away and then I edit it out and I, I put this stuff out. So uh, having that dedicated spot, I just you know go and turn on the lights a little bit before they come so the fluorescent lights kind of warm up and do all that stuff. If you were a purist, you would criticize my lighting of the white background because the fluorescent lights kind of had a bluish tone to it. Um, but I don't have a million dollar budget. You know? and, and, and at the end of the day, um, you know, I think the most important thing is that you're putting out useful content for either the people that are just reading your blog or for your clients. You know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I had a client really freaking out about that. Oh, I just don't like the quality, you know. They weren't necessarily upset with the quality of the video or the audio, they were just unhappy with their performance on camera. And I told them, like, look, right now we're filling a void. Right now, when your clients, customers go and look for this information, there's nothing. So we need to at least get something out there. Something's better than nothing. You know, as long as we're not, you're not just going out there and just acting like a total idiot and drooling on camera, it's going to be better than nothing. And I know a lot of people, you know, there's there's some people that'll get critical of me for that, and, you know, that's fine. But, uh, you know, what I can tell you is that as soon as you get this stuff out there, and you start putting it on YouTube, and then you put it on your blog, and, and, and it's out there, people react immediately. The first client that I started doing this for, we put out some videos on very, you know, he's a criminal defense lawyer, and we were putting out some stuff on some really, very specific types of cases uh, that you know he would get one or two of these cases a year, and suddenly he was getting calls from all over the country about it as soon as we put this one video up. I mean, and and, and it, it kind of.
kind of shocked both of us. It shocked him more than anything, and I played it cool. I was like, oh, of course. <laughs> that was the plan. <laughs> so, okay, so, you know, that's kind of the lighting stuff. Um, once again, you can get really crazy. The, the, the client that we've got, the plexiglass in the windows, we purchased a bunch of uh, flow lights, which are still not, you know, top end lights, but I mean, those were $600 a piece. Um, and it's super cool, and they, they look, you know, and if you, the thing is, is that if you know what you're looking for, you can tell the difference, but the majority of people, they don't care. I mean, like with my criminal defense lawyer, the, he's got clients who are facing, like, jail and stuff. <laughs> they're, not yeah, they're, not <laughs> they're not too upset about the quality of the video, right? What, they, what they're focused on is, this guy knows what he's talking about. You know, I'm going to hire him. Um, you know, I've got air conditioning clients where it's just, it's like I trust these people because, you know, this town's notorious for sending out salespeople who are supposed to be technicians. So that's kind of the big thing I try and get across with them. So, you know, from a business perspective, it's finding those little things that you want to convey to people. And once again, it goes back to the idea of your best salesperson having their best day 24-7 is, is what you're putting out. So, um... So I don't know, I mean, any questions? So my husband was talking about this last night and we're thinking about doing this for my site where I basically help authors learn the business side of writing because there's not a lot of video out there on this. And one of the things he was like, you know, to make it look really professional, you need to have an intro, an outro, lower thirds, and all that. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, How sure. we would do it? And so I use Final Cut Pro 10. Um, iMovie has got pretty similar uh, stuff. And then there's, uh, there's probably stuff for Windows for doing all this too. Um, when, you, when it comes to creating your motion graphics, uh, this is once again something you can get crazy about. You can get After Effects or motion and just spend a whole lot of time on that. My recommendation would be start really simple. Um, so the format I really like, and, and I can't remember who I copied this off of, but I definitely, is I have about a five to 10 second little intro snippet where the person introduces themselves and then what this video is gonna be about. Uh, and that's because everyone's got the worst attention span in the world on the internet. So you know, get that out real quick. And then I cut into the intro. And I'll usually cut straight to their logo and I'll have some sort of music going on that matches what I think kind of the mood should be for this series. And it's going to be the same music that I use for every single video. So, you know, and the nice thing that I like with iMovie and Final Cut Pro 10 is they come with a whole bunch of this stuff for free. And it's just right there. You, you just kind of go through and, and choose what you want. Um, if you don't like those options, there's, some really, there's one really good site to go to is... Um, well, it's Envato is the umbrella company, but they've got uh, so they've got Video Hive where you can go and buy like After Effects templates. Um, but then they've got another. It's Audio. It's either Audio Hive or Audio something. And for fifteen dollars, you can purchase uh, somebody's jingle and have full rights for one video that you're going to post it on. Um, it's Audio Jungle. Right? It's all under the Envato theme. Envato is like they've got a whole bunch of little marketplaces where anybody can go and upload. Like they've got themeforest.com where you can go buy WordPress themes. Um, and, uh, and it's been it's hugely successful for people. Uh, and the costs are pretty low. Like I said, for audio, it's usually like $5 to $15 for a jingle. Um, for a WordPress theme, it's like $45. Bucks. Um, so, you know, I, I have a nice, you know, and, then, and so, so for my opening uh, theme, opening titles, uh, we're talking five to 10 seconds long. So I flash the logo, and then, and then I cut to just a titling of what the video is about, right? And then, and then the audio ends, and then it goes back into the video. So when, when I'm recording the video, I, I just tell the person, okay, look, you know, introduce yourself and what this video is about pause for two seconds and then do the rest of the video and then that way when I'm in post I just cut it and, okay. you know uh, I try and 
try and think towards post all the time, because the less time you have to spend in post, the better, because you're going to spend most of your time in post, because rendering these video files is what takes the most time. Um, I think for a two minute video, I'm running a Retina MacBook Pro with 16 gigs of RAM. It takes nine minutes to transcode that video into an MP4 and then it into it. So, you know, just, you're always trying to shorten it up. So then closing, so, so the, I have them, they, they, they talk through the video, two to three minutes long. And then at the end of the video, I always have a call to action. Um, this is really important. It, it amazes me how many people do business, and even for a personal blog. You should have something like, hey, if you really like this, go on to Facebook and tell me that you liked it, or wherever you want them to go. Um, some sort of call to action, and then and maybe even a little graphic that comes up, so like I'll flash a phone number or something like that, rather than having them say the phone number, have a graphic for that. And then, and then you cut to your closing. Um, and so once again, I have the audio going on again, um, and I'll have, and then I'll have another call to action with some title graphics, like, hey, if you have questions, make sure to call us, or you know, anything like that. And I'll have that run for 10 or 20 seconds, and then I'll have it cut to the logo, and then some sort of a call to action for subscribing and commenting on YouTube specifically. And uh, if you go on to Google, you can image search a YouTube subscribe button. And then you put that into your video. And the reason that you do that is, once you get everything uploaded onto YouTube, there's a few little tricks that you do there. One of them, so for that you do, you go into the annotations section of YouTube. And in there you can like, you can put a bunch of links to different videos that you've got, and stuff like that. You can put a link on the subscribe button that when they click that, it subscribes them to your video channel. Um, so just just a little bit more work on the end there, uh, but and you know keep in mind those don't show up if someone's watching it on their phone or mobile. That's only on desktop that the annotations show up. Uh, but just nice little things to add. If you want to get clever, you can add thumbnails of other videos you've done, and then call to action people to click on those and go watch those. Um, you can also do that if during a video you reference another video you've done. That's a point in the annotations to go in and put a button that links to that video and just help kind of get some more uh, interaction there. Does that kind of help you with the titling and stuff? The lower thirds thing, you can do that too. Um, it, it all depends on the software you're using. Uh, iMovie and Final Cut Pro are great because they have all this stuff in there. Um, you know, uh, a couple of years ago they came out with Final Cut Pro 10, which really pissed off a lot of people in the industry because Final Cut Pro was kind of the industry standard. I mean, you have Avid and, and things for Hollywood and larger projects, but Final Cut Pro, when it came out in like 2000 or so, uh, really changed the industry. And then a few years ago, uh, Apple redid the interface and basically made it more like iMovie. Which for people like me, it's great because I don't know any better. I was using iMovie, and, and it's just super easy drag and drop. And, and so I really push everybody to go to that. If I'm using cool. When you're like just getting started, yeah. like, 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 tutorials or there are. Um, so once again, uh, YouTube. Uh, if you just go in and, and just do FCPX, and then whatever you want to learn about. Um, pretty much everybody just go. They just call it FCPX. Um, just put that in and then search for what you're trying to do, and somebody will have created a video on that. Um, Lynda.com is really one of the greatest websites around right now. Uh, I think their Final Cut Pro 10 essential training is 20 hours long. Um, and it's taught by an uh, industry professional who does it for a living. So she's not only teaching you the program, but she's also teaching you about um, you know, industry insights and just best practices and stuff like that. So you have to pay for that. I think the full version is like $37 a month, but then you get exercise files. And they've got a whole bunch of other stuff. If you want to learn Photoshop or Illustrator or anything under the sun, um, you might want to spell it. 
people. Oh, sorry, lynba.com. I thought I had slides, it would all be there, but there's a technical issue now. It's a Roger issue. Um, back to the, um, the lighting and the sound that you were talking about earlier, could you talk a little bit about um, if, you do, if you're doing something outside, and then if you have two subject matters, like for, um, for someone who's doing um, talking and they're doing food demonstrations, like um, we have here, yeah. um, it, lighting those two subjects? Yeah, so outdoor um, outdoor lighting becomes uh, a whole other game and stuff. I mean, you can do things where, you know, you're fi because the sun becomes a big problem now. It's, you know, it's a really bright light source. Um, so you either need to have even brighter lights that outshine the sun, or you need to shade the person. Um, or, you know, you want to angle them so they're kind of looking towards the sun a little bit. Um, that I, I haven't done as much outdoor interview type stuff. I do a lot of like B-roll shots outside and I do time lapses and things like that. But uh, for the most part, um, I like to have a controlled environment for any of the interview or talking head stuff that I do. Just because once again, uh, there's so many components that happen between lighting and sound. Once you go outside, I mean, then having a separate audio person doing a boom is almost essential because Everything changes so much there. Um, so I'm, I'm not really going to give you a good answer on that one. But as far as like cooking demonstrations go, you know, I've done a couple, I've tried a couple, um, you know, I, I'm vegan and I like to cook a lot, and so I'm like, ah, I should do some video stuff. Uh, it's, there's a lot of prep work. I mean, I, you know, you, first of all, you want to have everything prepped and ready to go. You know, you watch the cooking shows and they're just like, oh, you know. Yeah. And it's like, well, that must be nice. So, so you're planning on spending a whole lot of time prepping. But the more prep you do, the better it's going to be. Because if you're going to try and do it where you're not only making it at the same time as you're talking about it, you really want to have everything as smooth as possible. Um, or the other option is you shoot B-roll, right? You shoot yourself making the dish. And then separately, you shoot the audio. And then you can intercut. And you could cut from, and then you can cut from you being in front of a white screen talking. And while you're talking, then you overlay with some of the B-roll stuff that's going on. Um, that might be the better way to go about it. I, I don't know. Yeah, well, what I did, too, is because um, I was, my brother does a lot, but he lives in Atlanta, so I can't have him here. Sure. So he told me to do, um, like, kind of like you're saying, but I would do two runs, right? So I do everything straight where it's on me, and then I'll do it again, but because I'm doing my own scripting and I know what I want to say, it's critical where I think I want the transition to happen, that I say it the same so that I cut it there, and then when I'm going to do the demo of the cooking, right? So you're doing it two times. Then I'm filming me down because that's a different setup. So you have to do the first setup where you're actually cooking and it's all on you, and then you do it a second time where it's actually where you're doing the demos. You so know, when you're doing you it by yourself. Cameras, would you have to well, if you got two cameras, you're good. But I don't have two cameras, so <laughs> I don't have one right there and there. I do everything right here, and I use Final Cut Pro, and it's really easy, like you said, because all I have to remember is. You know, because I know what I want, yeah. and I know I want them to see this, so I know I'm going to say this one sentence right before, and it and it works perfectly. Sometimes I'm like, wow, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing you might want to check out um, is in Final Cut Pro you have multicam okay. capability, and so one thing you know what I'll do is I'll have my DSLR shooting, and then I'll set up my iPhone or my GoPro, mm -hmm. and if you shoot them all at the same time. And you, you can use the audio file to then synchronize them all together. And in Final Cut Pro, it's pretty cool. Uh, what you do is you just start playing the video, and it'll start with the first camera that you've got selected. And it'll have like the different cameras up here in, in, this, in, in a grid. Mm -hmm. And as it's playing along, you just click on the other camera, and it will transition to that shot in the timeline. Pretty wow. slick. Yeah, you might want to try that out, and, and, and that'll just, you know, you won't have to do two takes. Okay. Um, and it could speed things up for you yeah. a lot. Oh, good. Multi-cam? Multi Multi-cam, yes. Yes. 
And uh, and, there, and once again, if you YouTube, just YouTube FCPX Multicam, and there's there's at least like three really good tutorials that show you how to do it. And that's pretty slick. That's awesome. Because that's my issue too, is time. Trying to, get, I like to do a lot, because I only, I shoot, shoot day is like a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I have to start early, but like you said, that preparation, Friday, Monday through Friday, I gotta go shopping, gotta cut and chop, and yeah. do the food network thing. Oh, I got one made. <laughs> <laughs> do you have the two ovens yet, where you're like, now we're gonna cook it? I know, <laughs> but when I get a deal, they can, I can get that redone. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I've tried doing a couple of cooking videos, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of it's work. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Uh, my suggestion is if you're starting out doing video blogging, uh, just keep it to the talking head to start with. And I'll, um, there's the least amount of video work, there's the least amount of editing, and um, you know, it just, it, it, you know, if, unless you're already comfortable with talking in front of a camera, there's a lot of practice of just getting used to that. Um, and especially like if it's like an iPhone or you know like a really low camera like this, mm -hmm. like you know you just there's a lot of things that you have to kind of work out, and you're not going to work it out until you shoot it and then watch it, you know, and get horrified. <laughs> like, oh my God, I sound like that. <laughs> um, so so there's a lot of stuff with all that. Uh, any other questions? Right now? So you said you had like a GoPro because I thought. So what's the advantages of the GoPro? Because I just thought it was movement, like people just out the door. So the GoPro, there's a lot of advantages with it. Uh, first of all, it's pretty inexpensive. I mean, if you buy the top end uh, Hero 3 Plus Black Edition, it's $400. And you've got 1080p, you can do up to 60 frames a second. So if you want to do anything with slow motion, you shoot it at 60 frames a second and then put it into a 30 frames a second timeline, and and you'll have nice slow motion then. Um, also, it's really small, so you can put it in the little nooks and crannies really easily. Um, and then you know, and it, it is it's very wide angle, but you can actually adjust. It doesn't have to be the super wide angle. You can get a little bit narrower um, than what you normally see with the action videos. But um, you know, a lot of people are using them for. Um, uh, webinars and stuff like that, where it's just a little camera that you can just stick anywhere. And they've got a whole bunch of these little mounts and stuff. They've got suction cup mounts, you know, and, and so you can have some different fun with all that. I wouldn't put it in uh, no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They're fairly rugged, too. What's that? They're fairly rugged as well, right? Well, yeah, I mean, that's they, they all come in a waterproof case. Um, I don't know how much you want to drop them, but you know you can splatter stuff on them. So it might be fun to have one like really close into cooking and mm -hmm. things like that. Except for the fog, that's the problem I also have. I mean, not fog, but the steam okay. that you get if you close too close. Mm -hmm. I usually get that too. You know, if you're live cooking and you want them to see the bubbles, you know. So one thing you know there um, that you might want to experiment with. And that's where going into like the DSLR is nice because then you could get like a hundred millimeter lens, which means the camera's like way back over here, but it looks like it's right on top of whatever you're shooting. Um, and so that's the nice thing with DSLR is if you want to start getting some of these more like cinema look shots, uh, that's where you're getting a, a large aperture set. So that's where you get that bouquet look where everything, the background's really blurry, yeah. uh, but it's really sharp up front. So that's all the aperture setting. Mm -hmm. uh, your iPhone, I, the newest iPhones I think are at 2.2 now, which is pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I've got a, uh, the Nifty 50 by Canon. It's a 50 millimeter lens that's got a 1.8 aperture and that's only a hundred dollar lens. Um, and so, so you know, that's that's going starting to go into the next level of stuff, you know, the prosumer type situation. Uh, but now you're spending, you know, a decent amount of money, and you just kind of, you know, you need to balance that stuff can out. You, can you can you buy so you can buy the lens um, separate? Is this a separate lens or that DSLR is one camera? So the DSLRs have all got removable lenses. That's kind of one of the defining factors of an SLR camera. Um, and so they usually come with some sort of a kit lens that's like $100 or $200. And the kit lenses are not, they're not terrible. I mean, you, you can still shoot with those. 
but you're not going to get that really crisp kind of cinema look with it. And so that's where buying, like the Nifty 50 is a great one to start with because it's $100, $150. Um, it's plastic, but it shoots fine. And then, you know, if you want to, you can get the, the top end Canon 50 millimeter lens, which is a 1.2 aperture. Uh, that's a $1,500 lens. So it can go, it, it, <laughs> DSLRs start here and then they go, it, go, it gets crazy. Yeah. It gets crazy. And, you know, what people are discovering is they can use their iPhone or they can get a GoPro. Mm -hmm. And when you put it on YouTube, generally the best people are watching at it on is 720. Right. Anyway, uh, and then if they're watching it on their phone, it's like, right. it doesn't matter at that point. That's where the sound is just really important. So, um, uh, there's, a, there's a great cooking show that you might want to check out called uh, uh, Black Metal Vegan, it's something along those lines. And so this guy, he cooks, these, he cooks a vegan metal dish, but he's all dressed up kind of almost like Kiss style. Uh -huh. But even a little bit further, the whole time he's got like heavy metal music playing uh -huh. in the background and he announces it all dramatically and uses these crazy knives that are totally impractical. <laughs> and, and the video quality is, I mean, if, you know, if you're looking at it, you're like, this is kind of looks like crap, right. like the lighting's not good. Um, but he does all the video, all the audio is done in post, right? It's all voiceover. And he's got millions of hits. He's actually got a book deal. Right. That's what sure. gets or me. Or DVD deal. Yeah, that's what gets me. I'm like, I try not to be too much of, because uh, I know I'm not a pro at all. I'm just doing learning as I go. Yeah. But I'm trying not to be too critical because you got people getting hit up, off, like you said, low quality. and they. And so I'm like, it's really just in tune with what is it that my audience want. And I think my audience just want to see me cooking so that they can learn stuff. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that goes back to, you know, when I, when I had a client who was just freaking out about, is this good enough? It's like, it, 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 it's fine. It's, it's filling something that you've got nothing right now. You know, so at least, at least get something out there and, and, you know, start experimenting with more things. So my, you know, my biggest thing is, just get the camera, get a little bit of focus on lighting. If you can't get the audio figured out, do the audio in post, okay. you know? And, and then with the cooking show, you know, learning to do more with the graphics then, because like, you know, listing out the ingredients, when you're talking about the ingredients, have those graphics show up that list them right there. And that'll just help people kind of solidify more and understand things. Is that Final Cut Pro? Is there a sample for that? Because I didn't see that. Like, yeah, so that's under the titling. Wow. So there's a, there's a, it's a T mm -hmm. in the lower left mm -hmm. corner. And then there's a whole bunch of different options that you can go into. And you choose, you drag and drop those on, and you can, you can move those position wise. And then uh, the parameters box is in the upper right hand corner. Mm -hmm. And I think if you do Command 4, that's the keyboard shortcut to bring that up. And then there's a ton of parameters. You can change the text size, text color, the font, um, endless, endless permutations there. Have you ever played around with the camera, as crazy as it sounds, the camera lens attachments for iPhones? Yeah, yeah the hollow clip? Yeah. I mean, I've seen a few different styles of them. Some of them even kind of get a little bit pricey, surprisingly, for a camera sort of clip on. But yeah. do those go, I mean, do those work to bridge the gap between an iPhone and a, and a higher end camera at all, or what? So the Olo Clip is the one I would recommend, uh, I think, for 60 bucks. Who's that? O L L O C L I P, one word. Um, they've been out for a few years now. And. The nice thing with them is it's there's three lenses in, in one clip on like that. You have a wide angle, you have a fisheye, and then you unscrew the wide angle and it's a macro. Mm -hmm. There's a little magnifying yeah. lens. Uh, the problem with those is now you're adding extra layers of glass, so the image quality needs to go down just a little bit. Um, but I mean you get you know you can get some nice wide shot. Um, it's actually pretty cool on the iPhone. Because when you switch from camera to video on the iPhone, um, it, it significantly crops down the image. Right. When you put the hollow clip on, even with the fisheye lens, it doesn't look super ridiculous. It actually looks pretty nice. It's, it's kind of like a wide angle lens. I can't remember the millimeter equivalent of them. Mm -hmm. um, but and that, and that just opens up a lot of options for you too. 
uh, you know, the wider angle it gets, just, you know, you, you can hold the camera over while you're cooking, just right here, and if it's a wide angle lens, it'll catch every picture, so you can be a little less precise. So, I absolutely, the Olive Clip is great, and then the Glyph, G-L-I-F, is, it's a little plastic uh, device, it, I didn't bring it with me, that your iPhone sits into it, and then it's got a thread for going onto a tripod. So then you can mount your iPhone onto a tripod. And, um, and so that's, that's really slick to get. If you're using the iPhone, get those two. I think the Glyph is 35 bucks now. Well, I, don't, well, I got another one that's not quite that expensive. It okay. fries electronics. Okay, sure. Yeah, there's a, there's a ton of, you know, the, the iPhone accessory market's gotten crazy. Uh, Glyph's pretty cool because it's just two guys that started this oh, up okay. four years ago. Oh, so, you know, you feel good about supporting What about, um, how good are the, are the tablets now? What if I get the deep, deep specs, like, because uh, this one now is the, um, this the Galaxy Tab 3. Okay. So how can I find, like, how good the quality is for video so that I can maybe use this as well? Sure, yeah. Um, I, you know, just if you just Google okay. uh, the, the camera specs for whatever okay. device you're using, um, I think that the new iPads have finally gotten a camera in there that's, that's considered okay. really good. And then uh, the, and the Android tablets, I don't follow as closely, uh, but I'm sure that they're increasing the camera capability on them. Does Glyph make holders for that? Because that's the other issue if I wanted to. You know, I don't know that they do, but I'm sure somebody is creating okay. a tripod holder for Just put in your tablet name yeah. and then a tripod case. Okay. And I'm sure that there's people with that. So you can have a case like this that it kind of plays with the angle with it, right? Yeah. Just got to get it up. Yeah. I think Bookstone has one. Which one? I think Bookstone has one. Oh, Bookstone. Yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so. We're out of time. Okay, so one, the last thing I just want to cover real quick. Uh, when you upload stuff onto YouTube, there's a number of different things that you should be doing on YouTube to just help um, expand its visibility. So tags are one thing. Uh, you want to make sure you're putting in relevant tags for what the videos are about. That'll help. That'll help Google understand what the video is supposed to be about. Um, you know, you don't want to just mindlessly spam a whole bunch of stuff in there. But you can put a lot of tags in there. I haven't seen anything that says more than ten tags is bad. Um, uh, and, and the cool thing is in your YouTube account, there's, you, if you go into the settings, there's a uh, default kind of parameters tab where you can go in and you can say, hey, anytime I upload a new video, I want these tags to already be in there. Um, I want the description field to already have all the links to my websites. Um, I want the location to be set as such. Uh, you can you can set a lot of default stuff. It'll just it'll speed things up for when you're uploading them in there. Uh, but one thing that I would absolutely recommend you do if you're doing this uh, in like a business type sense is get your videos transcribed, um, unless you can do it. Uh, I use a service, um, and I think it's like foxtranscribe.com. They charge a dollar per minute of video and they turn the files around. They say it's 48 hours. I've been getting them in four hours. It's called what? Uh, I think it's foxtranscribe.com. Uh, Real SEO, I think I discovered it on Real SEO. So doesn't YouTube have some sort of transcription? Is, does it work as well as Google Voice, which is to say not at all? <laughs> it's not good. It's not ready for Because I saw that kind of being hyped up on something I was watching recently. Oh yeah, it's great. Just hit a button and I was like, wow, that seems a little yeah, it, it, I, it's never been even close for me. Is it good enough to, I mean, obviously you want to go back through, even with Fox Transcribe, you have to go back through it and kind of no. polish it up at all? No, the reason I like this one okay. is, uh, and I do, I always check to make sure everything's good, but you know, there's been a case where maybe a couple of tenses have been off, Okay, but that's about the worst of it. Um, How much was it you said? It's a dollar per minute. Yeah. Is that overseas or just a bunch of people? You were like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It gets it done. It's quick. And so then sure. there's two things, or there's three things you do with that transcription. You put it in the description of the video, 
Uh, you put it in the closed captionings for the video. Could you repurpose it as a blog post? And well? then you put it into a blog post. Um, and then and then all of that text is now indexable by Google. Uh, making sure that you put it in the closed captions because that then Google uh, will associate text with certain parts of your video and there's all types of SEO benefits. Is yeah. there any search, I mean, does it? Does Google go so far as to get into its own transcription of the text of a video for search results? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so you're you're just hope they interpret it right? And then, and well, then that's, that's why those. getting the transcription done uh, with a professional service. Can you upload your own transcription? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then you just upload. Okay. When you're in, when you go into the edit screen of a YouTube video, um, I think it's just, it says CC, just, mm -hmm. and you click on that. And then you can, uh, there's two options for uploading, and where I want to choose the one where you can just copy and paste stuff in. Right. Then the last trick is you want to enable monetization on your YouTube account. And what that means is YouTube can then show ads on your videos. However, you only turn that on for one of your videos, unless you want to have ads showing up on your videos. Because um, really, unless you're getting millions of hits, you're not going to make any money. But when you turn on that monetization, Google then allows you to upload a custom thumbnail for your video. So when you upload a video, normally they give you three thumbnails to choose from that they've chosen seemingly yeah, randomly. <laughs> and it's usually when you're like this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what you can do is you go into Photoshop or whatever image editing program you're doing and just create a 1080p image um, and, and you know maybe have your picture on there and then have the title of the video on there. Uh, and some people go so far as to have like some graphics and eye catcher. But then when people are looking at Google and YouTube results, that's the thumbnail they're seeing. And it, it you can only do that by enabling ads. You yeah, you have to enable monetization. Okay. But you don't have to enable monetization for all of your videos. You, uh, you do it on a per video basis if you want to turn on monetization. You don't have to have that on in order to be able to add your custom. And without that, the thumbnail is just random. Pretty well, you, you get an option of three oh, right. choices, and you choose one of them. Okay. They never look right. All right. Thank you. Oh, one more. I was gonna say I, I heard of another trick related to that that you actually end up like you turn on monetization, but you actually buy the ad on your own video and you click it back to your blog or to your site. Oh, Absolutely. So yeah. Like someone else yeah. YouTube it. advertising. I'm not even going to try to get in it because Greg's going to talk now. But YouTube advertising is is <laughs> is uh, pennies on the dollar advertising. If you're doing anything with AdWords, you should absolutely be doing some video advertising on YouTube because you'll spend a ton less money and get even more reach. So. Cool. Uh, I'm Roger Williams. My uh, Twitter handle is Roger Media. My company is RogerWilliamsMedia.com. If you want to reach out to me, I'm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.